Hello and welcome to our ROS tutorial, fun approach delivered to you by Samer. Um, a quick recap on what we did so far. We were introduced to Gazebo and we managed to launch one of its worlds, uh, actually multiple of its worlds, and we spawned a third of about three burger and waffle pie robots into the simulation. And we also ran the SLAM G mapping node and we started to navigate through the environment and started to build our map and then finally we saved that map. So what are we going to do today? Today we're going to get introduced to some terms like navigation, path planning and control. We're going to launch the navigation package in Gazebo. Uh, so that will be a direct implementation of these terms. Uh, and we're going to set autonomous motion of the robot starting from some initial pose to a target pose using Arvis. So, let's dive in. So what we're going to do right now is that we're going to get introduced to some uh, terms here, like navigation. Well, navigation includes all the modules that are associated with autonomous motion. Uh, the navigation package includes the SLAM module, or the localization and mapping modules. It also includes the path planning module and the control module. So all these modules are, you know, uh, working together to achieve the task of autonomous navigation. So navigation is like the big uh, brother or the father of all of these terms. Uh, and it's basically the uh, final target that we want to reach eventually and the target of this course. Uh, we got another term called path planning. Uh, what path planning simply means is that I, I'm located at some point here, which is A, and there is a target point here, which is B. So I need to have like uh, an intuition regarding uh, uh, the optimal path I'm gonna uh, uh, choose uh, to get from A to B. So when it comes to two points in uh, in a void space, then the the easiest path or the optimal path would be a straight line, so just straight from A to B. But the situation uh, becomes kind of uh, complicated when there are multiple obstacles here. Uh, well, I cannot say that the optimal path is uh, a straight line. It's no longer a straight line, but it would be something like that, for example, something like that. Considering the diameter of the robot and uh, the fact that it wouldn't be able to pass through like uh, a little sp uh, space here. So the process of path planning becomes a necessity when you talk about autonomous navigation. So what path planning simply is, it is the algorithm that is responsible for generating the optimal trajectory or path from an initial pose here, which is A, to a target pose here, which is B. All right. So basically what the path planning does is that it, uh, it receives uh, the desired goal, so let's denote it by G, and the initial pose here, which is I, and then it produces the optimal path. So it's like x and y and theta coordinates. And they might have timestamps as well, so we might add t to the dimension. Um, so we've got like a series of x, y, theta and timestamp, uh, uh, let's call them set points for example. And these set points are later received by a controller. So the function of the controller is to get these set points and then through feedback coming from sensors and sometimes coming from SLAM itself or mapping or localization. So any of these modules that are related to state estimation or localization, right? Because state estimation means I want to estimate your current X and Y and theta, all right? And you already got the time of the system. Um, on your uh, on your vehicle computer so this is basically the feedback that you need so this is like the sensory feedback and what a closed loop uh, feedback control system does is that it receives the set points which are the desired um, you know uh, trajectory points and 
the actual feedback coming from your sensors, either raw sensors, so you got two options, either raw sensors, all right, or you get it from the SLAM module or some state estimation module. For example, you might have like a mapping module, uh, like a LiDAR, and you got the uh, uh, location uh, directly recorded through a GPS, or you might have um, a LiDAR and you uh, don't have the location of the robot, so, and you might have, uh, you know, like a, a saved map that you already have uh, from you know, um, some initial mapping process or something like that. So you use that map to localize yourself. So you got basically a localization module, or you might have both like the SLAM uh, algorithm. So all of these options are regarded as state estimation modules, right? So you might have one of them or multiple of them. And then the control module takes this feedback. And of course, it's preferred to have some sort of a SLAM module or localization module or uh, a mapping module uh, rather than raw sensor data unless your sensors are super accurate and having super accurate sensors might uh, indicate that you've paid a lot for that robot so SLAM modules and software modules might uh, reduce the cost of the system while deriv delivering the same output or the same accuracy so usually the raw sensor uh, option is not the preferred option unless you have like a lot of money that you want to spend Right. So anyway, the control module takes this feedback and begins to apply some control algorithm. And there are multiple control algorithms. I'm not going to go through the details of control algorithms because control in self or automatic control is a very broad subject. Uh, there are multiple uh, control scenarios, including linear controllers, uh, nonlinear controllers, optimal controllers, model predictive controllers, uh, reinforcement learning controllers there's a lot of you know controllers out there so whatever your control module is it just takes these inputs and then delivers a control action so this control action will basically be the motion of your motors or your wheels so the motor receives an electrical signal which is a voltage signal coming out of some motor driver that is you know connected to your microcontroller or your microcomputer here uh, uh, on which the algorithm or the control algorithm is deployed and then it produces that voltage signal which rotates the motor and then the motor begins to execute that control command in order to control the velocity or the linear velocity and the angular velocity of the wheel and therefore control the linear and angular velocities of the robot as a whole in order to achieve this uh, trajectory. So when it comes to path planning, sometimes or some path planning modules are divided into some global planner and a local planner. So we'll denote these by GP and LP. So a global planner is a planner that plans your trajectory based on a global map. So you got a saved global map or some global map coming from a SLAM algorithm that is being uh, uh, constantly developed over time. And then you get that uh, map, for example, a map like that. And then you begin to analyze that map and you begin to determine where the obstacles are. So I'm going to assign high cost values, high locomotion co cost values to these uh, obstacles, right? which means that the robot or the algorithm is less likely to choose these uh, points or pixels uh, as points of uh, motion or as set points for our trajectory. And in fact, it doesn't choose them at all. So the cost, the the, the cost is pretty high here, and the cost is uh, you know reduced as uh, as you move further away from the obstacles. So the clear the clearer the path, the 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 less the cost is gonna be, and therefore this algorithm changes that map into a cost map here with values. All right, um, that denote the cost. Of existence in that pixel, right? So I think the higher the cost, uh, uh, the the less likely you're gonna select that pixel, right? And the clearer the path, the less the cost. So therefore, your algorithm tends to pick locations that are not occupied or that are further away or that far away from occupied pixels, right? So this is what the global planner does. 
and it's called global because it basically relies on a global map. What the local planner does, it does the same exact thing, but it actually relies on a local map. We said that we have uh, in our SLAM module, there were multiple you know, observation instances coming from our LiDAR, for example, so you construct something called a local map. And we said that we overlap these successive local maps in order to update the global map. But sometimes the global map update is not as fast as the local map update. So you get a local map right now. Let's assume that this local map uh, designates that there is some obstacle right in front of you right now. So you have to avoid that obstacle before the global map updates itself. Otherwise, you'll collide before the global map gets to update itself and let the robot understand that there is a there is an obstacle right in front of it and sometimes you might rely on a static map and by static map I mean like a map that was already constructed and saved like the map that we constructed earlier so assuming that I opened up the uh, turtle bar 3 simulation environment and relied only on the map that was there we said that sometimes even inside uh, uh, closed areas or indoor areas Sometimes there are unexpected obstacles. Someone like uh, threw something away. Someone for uh, someone forgot a box somewhere. So that the the shape of the environment changed. There are some additional features that are added to the environment. So if I'm using the global map that I constructed, maybe this this map was constructed like two days ago. So it's not updated. There are some. It's it is quite similar to what we have right now in the actual physical situation, but it can't be hundred percent accurate because. You know, environments change on a daily basis. Uh, maybe something fell, maybe, you know, something appeared out of nowhere. So in order for us to account for that, we have a local planner. So we get the individual observations of sensors, which is LiDAR in this case, and we construct uh, small local maps that define, you know, uh, some area around the robot currently. And what this local planner does is that it begins to analyze if something is different from the global map. And once there are differences, it begins to like change the path plan, right? Or update it in order to avoid that newly found obstacle, right? Sometimes there are some dynamic obstacles as well, like people moving. Uh, we, we talked about dynamic obstacles and said that it's quite complicated to incorporate dynamic obstacles, but if we have a small number of dynamic obstacles, like uh, we're having like two people moving in the warehouse, for example, or uh, another robot moving in front of me, so I might have like some sort of a contingency plan. So this local planner would realize that there is an obstacle right now in front of me at this particular instant of time, and I don't care if it's static or dynamic. I just need to uh, get around it and uh, complete uh, the entire path. Right. So this is the function of the local planner. So the, the local planner and the global planner go hand in hand. And sometimes if the global planner or the global map is updated quite fast and the frequency of its update is quite fast and could incorporate several changes in the environment, then the global map might be or the global planner might be the dominant planner in this case. And vice versa, if my environment is very dynamic and the rate of update of the global, uh, the global map is not so fast, then... I might have a problem uh, and I might resort to the local planner as a solution. So these are basically the theoretical terms that I want to introduce right now before uh, trying out the navigation package. So let's move on to the navigation package, right? So what we're going to do right now is that we're going to open our uh, TurtleBot 3 e-manual and we're going to get to the navigation simulation, which is right after the slant simulation that we did before. That is section 6.3 here. And we need to first launch the simulation world. So I'm going to open up a new terminal. All right, let's open up a new terminal in case you're just, you know, uh, open a new terminal as well. And uh, let's export uh, the model uh, burger. So we're going to copy that and we're going to paste it here to let the terminal know that we're using the burger uh, version of the TurtleBot 3. And then we're going to ROS launch the TurtleBot 3 world. So we're going to copy that. I'm going to paste it. Then we're going to run it. So right now, Gazebo is set up, and we're currently in 
this environment, which is the TurtleBot3 environment or TurtleBot3 world. So what we need to do now is to run something called the navigation node. So the navigation node is part of the navigation package or the TurtleBot3 navigation package. All right. And this is the launch file of the TurtleBot3 navigation. And what this navigation module needs, it, it needs the, the map folder, or the, sorry, the map file, or the map YAML file that we generated last time in our home directory. And this is why you can find that the, the address that is written here, or the directory that's written here, is the home directory, because it knows already that we saved that file or save that map into our home directory. You can change uh, the address in case you save the map somewhere else. But because this is just an exercise, so I'm gonna I'm just gonna use the home directory. It's better if you locate your map within your package or your development project, right? So as usual, uh, let's investigate this uh, navigation package. So I'm gonna head to computer, uh, opt, ROS, Yotic. And I'm going to go to the share folder, and then I'm going to search for Turtle Sim Turtle Bot 3 navigation, which is here, right? And we've got uh, some map files here. So there are some saved maps here. And this map looks pretty similar to what we did uh, earlier in our last tutorial. So we got to use this map as well. You can use that if you want. So you you just change uh, the directory. But this map was made in advance, right? Just like our map, but it's already available here. It's like, um, you know, the developer just placed it here in case you want to use it right away instead of making your own. Uh, we've got some launch files here. And, well, we've got three launch files here. And it's good that I opened them up because I want to talk about each one. So we've got something called the AMCL the launch. And this is called the Adaptive Monte Carlo Localization. Right, which is an algorithm designed specifically for the localization. And it's called adaptive because, well, it's a concept related to something called the particle filter. So the particle filter is one of the state estimation techniques that rely on discretizing our model. So instead of just like having a continuous probability distribution, it just assumes that <coughs> our probability is discrete and can be represented in terms of points. And the more uh, points you have, the more accurate you can get because the more the points you have, the more you are like having a more inclusive probability distribution. Uh, but since this is computationally inefficient, we need to, you know, um, have an adaptive number of samples from our distribution. In case you're familiar with probability, you might, might I, I might sound confusing right now because if you're you don't have uh, like a statistics and probability background, then my words might seem a little bit confusing, but it's okay. It's just like everything in our state estimation process is de is uh, is described in terms of probability. So let's get back to our whiteboard here, right? So we've got something like a probability distribution. I'm saying that I'm most like I'm more uh, I'm most likely in that situ in that position or that pose, but I'm not really sure. So what is your uncertainty? Your uncertainty defines how unsure you are about your pose. All right, so suppose you're here, for example, having this pose. Your actual pose might be slightly different from that pose, like that is the actual frame, all right? So there is always some noise or deviation, even after sensor fusion, even after you use slam techniques and stuff like that. There is always some noise, and you can quantify that noise by a quantity called a variance, because every random variable has a mean and has a variance. The mean is the most uh, likely scenario, and the variance is how far you can be from the mean, how likely you can be far from the mean. So if you have a high variance, that means your distribution looks like something like that, in case you have a normal distribution. And in case you don't know what a normal distribution is, it's fine. Just imagine that our variable has this mean. So this is the most likely scenario. So if you draw a probability distribution like this one, for example, sorry, uh, it's not the uh, accurate, let's just, yeah, this one here. So the quantity that has the highest value 
is the most likely scenario and therefore it's our mean right so as as you're moving far from the mean the value of the belief continues to decrease and that means it is very less likely that you're in this area for example so you have like a 99 percent shot that you're somewhere here right and 70 percent of that probability is that you're at the mean so that's why the mean has the highest probability and the sum of all these probabilities is 100 percent or one right pretty much the same values that we got in our map we said that our map ranges from 0 to 100 percent when it comes to the values of the pixels and that depends on how sure you are about whether this pixel is occupied or not so 100 percent means you're 100 percent sure that it is occupied zero means you're 100 percent sure it's empty all right and same goes for every state estimation uh, uh, state uh, like the x the y the theta your angular velocities, your linear velocities, and so on and so forth. Every value has a variance. Uh, so if we get back here, we'll find that the AMCL uses some probability approach or probabilistic approach in order to, you know, uh, get to define uh, your uh, your your location. All right. So it tries to get the best estimate of your location, and it tries to make the probability distribution uh, as accurate as possible and as closer to the mean as possible, right? And it's called adaptive because it uses some adaptive technique in order to reduce the computational uh, gravity of that procedure. Because if you don't use an adaptive technique, then you'll use a huge number of samples from your distribution in order to compute the probability of your location. And that means you'll consume more computational power and your algorithm will be very slow and therefore your system will not be real time. So your robot will take so much time to uh, try to understand where it is. So as time progresses, you can reduce the number of samples because your belief in the current number of samples is quite strong and the samples are closer to the mean as possible. Then you don't need a large number of samples to represent your distribution. So well, you might not fully understand that, but let's just say it's some form of an algorithm that tries to compute where your current location is, and it tries to get the, boss, the best possible estimate. And we might see a visualization for that that might bring the idea, uh, the idea closer to your mind. So if you open up that, we'll find some arguments. It's basically based on the LiDAR sensor. So you got the scan topic, which is the LiDAR scans. So you have to have the topic uh, active in order for it or in order for this algorithm to, you know, take that sensory input and begin to run its analysis. And you got, you got to have some initial pose X, Y, and A. I think that A represents theta, but I don't know what's called A here. Uh, I, I most likely type TH if, I, if I'm denoting theta, but anyway, it doesn't matter. So I've got some parameters of um, the... AMCO node or algorithm here and I'm not going to talk about you know these parameters and I'm not because these parameters are related to the execution of the algorithm which is a complex uh, subject that needs a course of its own on slam techniques and probabilistic robotics which is a pretty advanced topic that's usually taught in master's courses but let's just say that this is the launch file of this algorithm and what the AMCL does is that it performs a localization, pure localization. So in order for the AMCL to run, you must have some static map already saved. We got another file called the move base. And what the move base is, as the name suggests, you're just moving the base of the robot. You're basically moving your robot, right? So this has to do with uh, your local planner, your global planner, and the cost map and stuff like that. So this is basically the algorithm that takes all of these, you know, inputs coming from the localization module or uh, your SLAM module or even your raw sensor data. And then it gets the cost map that was produced from, you know, the path planning module, right? And the input of the global path in order to move your base or let the robot move. So move base is somehow related to the control module and path planning modules at the same time. So I've got some uh, arguments like the global cost map and the local cost map. We talked about that before. And there are some parameters for this local cost map and global cost map. We'll go through these parameters shortly after. 
we've got parameters for the move base as well. So it's basically all about parameters. And what the move base does is it, it moves your robot, is responsible for producing the, you know, the control actions that are going to move your robot eventually. And we've got the Turtle Paw 3 navigation. Well, it's basically a, combina a combination of all of these. So it launches your, uh, your map server, it launches your, uh, uh, there's a Turtle Paw 3 remote not launch. I'm not sure what this file is about, but we can just uh, neglect it for now. Uh, we've got the move base here, and we got to open Arvis. So what this navigation launches is basically some setup. So it launches your move base, it launches your, uh, you know, it gets your map. So it gets the, the map YAML file that we said we would want in order for us to run the algorithms that we discussed. So the global coast, uh, sorry, the global planner needs a static map or a map coming from SLAM. So in our case, we have a static map that we already developed. So this map uh, YAML file is going to be fed to uh, the TurtleBot3 navigation package, right? Uh, and yeah, that's probably it. So we're just feeding our inputs to our the TurtleBot3 navigation the launch file here is like the, the basic launch file that launches all the other launch files and feeds the parameters to these. Uh, nodes and we've got something called param here which is basically the m files it's like the config file of the turtle bot 3 navigation package but here it's called param all right and we've got some parameters for the base local planner we've got a coast map parameters for each type of robot so depending on your robot whether you're having waffle pie or whether you're having waffle or burger and the same thing for the local planner uh, this is called DWA local planner. So if you open up some of these uh, files, you'll find some parameters that are related to your planner, like the limits of the velocity of the robot. So the maximum velocity of the robot is 0.18 meter per second, and the minimum velocity is 0.08 meter per second, for example. The same goes for theta, one rad per second and negative one rad per second. These are the minimum and maximum values. And in place velocity theta, that's basically, you know, your velocity rotating around yourself while you're static, not moving forward. There are limits for the acceleration as well. And there are some tolerance values, like the tolerance is like you want to reach some goal. So what is the tolerance? What is the acceptable error? Uh, if that, if your current location uh, lies within, you know, an acceptable uh, tolerance, or, an accept or below an acceptable threshold, so you have an acceptable error value, then you'll turn off your local planner because you've already reached the target and as accurate as possible. All right. So there is a parameter called holonomic robot. This is another type of robot. So our robot is differential. So we set like the holonomic robot uh, parameter to false because holonomic robots have different kinematics than differential drive robots or two-wheeled robots like the one we have. Holonomic robots have multiple degrees of freedom, so it can move like six, like 45 degrees instead of just forward. All right, it can move in the y direction, but our uh, robot has to rotate before going through the the y direction. So our robot is basically like a car. You never see a car moving like a transverse motion or a traverse motion. Uh, transverse motion. I can't remember the term, but you get what I mean. All right. Uh, Forward simulation parameters, yeah, the, um, well, I'm not interested in, the, in these parameters right now, so just neglect them. Right, we've got the coast map parameters. So we've got some parameters like the obstacle range and the ray trace range. Um, uh, I think this has to do with the maximum size of the obstacle or something like that. Uh, well, this is the footprint of the robot. This means these are the size limitations of the robot. Uh, so the robot, if we measure the dimensions of the robot starting from the origin of the robot, so you can find that it is like t a negative 20 centimeters. And uh, so its size, I can say that it's kind of, you know, between 30 centimeters 
uh, in the x direction and I think in the y direction is something like 0. Point, um, yeah it's 0. 0.3 something in the y and like 0. 0.277 or maybe more a little bit more in the uh, x direction so our robot is not uniform uh, that's this is why he commented the robot radius because the robot radius is a suitable parameter in case you're having a circular robot but the turtle bot 3 is not perfectly circular so it has like different dimensions in x and y so this is why he's elaborating the footprint like having limits right so you got some limit in the positive x-axis and some limit in the negative x-axis and some limit in the positive and negative y-axis so you've got something called the inflation radius. Uh, so the inflation radius is basically you're uh, you're saying that your obstacle. Uh, well, when you draw the cost map, you're not just going to consider the pixel or the obstacle pixel as your prohibited area. That's because if you consider that the path planning module treats the robot as a point. Uh, and this is what the path planning algorithm does. It considers, you know, your particle as just one point. But a robot has a size, it has a footprint. So what happens if I consider the, the robot as a point? That means that the center of the robot would be that point, and in that case, the, 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 the path planner might consider, well, might draw that, so let's just say you have an obstacle here. So if you consider your robot as a point, so you might draw a path that looks like that. All right? And it's pretty normal for the algorithm to consider that because this point has not collided with the, with the obstacle. But the fact is the robot looks like that. And if it continues to follow that path, then it's going to collide. There, there's going to be some interference here. So you get something called the inflation radius in order to maximize the size of your uh, obstacle here in order to account for the radius of the robot. So basically you pick that inflation radius to be kind of close to the radius of the robot itself or the closest circle to the radius of the robot since this robot is not perfectly circular so we, we pick a circle that encompasses the whole robot as some sort of approximation. And this inflation radius is the thing that you know uh, maximizes the size of this obstacle in order to account for this radius so that the robot will not collide. So if we have the obstacle like this, this is the original obstacle, and this is like the inflated obstacle. So in this case, if I draw my path, it will look something like that. And then when the robot passes through that pass, it will not collide with the object because the object was inflated. I made like some safety factor here. In order to account for the radius of the robot. So this is another interesting parameter. The cost scaling factor has something to do with you know uh, the computation of the cost value for each pixel and the map type is called cost map of course and the observation sources are scanned. This means that um, uh, basically for example if you're using a local planner then the source of your uh, sensory information is the scans of your lidar and these are some parameters related to you know the data type of uh, the the lidar messages which is laser scan for example the topic is called scan uh, there are some other parameters uh, that i'm not int currently interested in all right so these are basically parameters or like the constant parameters of the navigation package so if you open up again we'll find some other parameters like the global coast map parameters so this is this uses the global frame of the map itself instead of some local map we have the map or the global map that was constructed earlier or in case you're using slam then it's the global map coming from slam that it has been constructed so far and you've got the robot base frame this is the label of the robot base frame or the base footprint so we've got an update frequency here so the frequency is like 10 which means 10 hertz that means 10 times per second so that means that the global map updates itself each 0.1 second in case your speed is is low like uh, up to 0.5 meter per second then this is quite fine because uh, within 0.1 second you'll just move like five centimeters and this is well 
kind of cool, right? But if your robot is like a formula racing car, an autonomous formula racing car, then 0.1 second is, you know, such a long period. And that means your robot would have moved or your car would have moved like for, a, you know, a significant distance during that period. So that means that the global map update rate is not enough. And this is when the local planner kicks in. You have the publish frequency, which is equal to the update frequency. So you publish right after the update. And there's something called a transform tolerance. I'm not sure what this parameter means, but no problem. And then you set the static map to true because you're using a static map. In case you're using, you know, a pre-saved map, then you have to assign this parameter to true. And this is the case for our exercise today. We're going to use the save map that we developed last time. We've got local cost map parameters, which include that global frame is the odometer frame, which is a local frame. And it has the same update frequency, and which makes me wonder why we're using a local map, uh, a local cost map at all. Maybe it's because in our case we have a pre-saved map, which means that the pre-saved map will not contain, um, you know, anomalies that have been introduced uh, since we last recorded uh, the map of the environment. But in case you're using a SLAM module, then your global map is is gonna is gonna likely update at the same time the local map is updated. So that means when you're using SLAM, the global map is gonna be more effective, uh, and you might do without the local planner in case that's the update frequency. If the update frequency of the local planner is higher than the global planner, then it might be of some use. Right. So the static map is false because we're using uh, a current local map, a map that has been developed uh, right now. Uh, using the LiDAR sensory information. And there are some other uh, parameters that I'm not interested in. Right, so these are basically the ideas that you need to be familiar with in order to understand what you're running. You're not just running some node. You have to understand the intuition behind that node because you as an engineer, you're implementing stuff. You're not asked to, as a ROS developer, you're not usually asked to develop something from scratch because that's like a very advanced professional level um, that you get to do after a lot of academic studies and uh, a lot of research, right? Uh, but as a junior ROS developer, you'll be asked to implement or, uh, you know, execute readily made solutions, but you need to understand how to execute these solutions and the intuition behind these parameters in case you want to change some parameters to fit your problem. So, um, all right, let's get back to our e-manual. So what I'm gonna do right now is that I'm gonna launch uh, the Turtle Pod 3 navigation environment. Uh, so I'm going to open a new tab, and I'm going to export the Turtle mo uh, Bot 3 model, which is burger. Kind of makes me hungry. All right. And then we're going to ROS launch this Turtle Bot 3 navigation package using the YAML file that we've developed. And then we're going to run it. And What's going to happen now is that we will have something like this. So Arvis has shown up with, you know, all the maps uh, right in front of us. And we've got some, you know, laser scans, all right? So the laser scans are kind of shifted from the actual position. And we'll know why now, all right? So you've got the laser scans like the green parts here. The, the, there are a lot of green, but I mean these little green points here. And you've got your global map, right? Uh, so your global map is shifted from, you know, the original map, right? Uh, and what else? Um, We've got some green dots here, some like some really small green dots here. So these dots represent the probability distribution of your robot. That means we are not certain where the robot it, where the robot is because the number of this sam the number of these samples is quite large. 
So each of these points represents a possible location of the robot. So we don't know where our robot is. It might be in any of these uh, locations. Someone might say, I already know that the robot is here. Yeah, it's because you're viewing the simulation environment. You're viewing uh, Gazebo and Arvis. But the robot itself, it's not aware of where it is. So you can tell that the robot is here. But how can the robot itself tell where, where it is? So the robot thinks it's somewhere here. By the way, if you look at Gazebo here, the robot is here. But on Arvis, the robot thinks it's here. And this is why the global map is shifted. Because, you know, the scans that you're taking right now indicate that these are the, you know, this, these are the walls that are quite close to you right now. So if you see here, the global map is shifted, and you got these laser scans here that represent the local map, for example. So if I hide that, you'll find that the local map has disappeared. And the global map, well, the global map was here. Your global map was drawn with the assumption that the robot was right in the middle. All right? Which is not the case. So the global map was drawn... And as far as I remember, we start from the middle, or maybe the initial location is initialized to the the origin of the environment of Gazebo. So whatever the reason is, it's because you fail to initialize your robot's location correctly. So the robot thinks it's here, and this is not true, right? So it, it assumed that its initial location lies within the middle of the global map. While its scans show something else, because the scans are true, the scans are coming from the actual physical situation, and this is why the scans seem to be the true case here. So our global map is shifted from the actual physical map that does exist. All right. Uh, you've got no plan, so I've got laser scans. We can hide the laser scans if you want. So the laser scans are the green dots here. All right. We've got the map. So yeah, this is basically the map coming from the map topic. Right, I'm currently interested in the global map and the current local map that's being drawn. Right. So we've got the laser scans, we've got the grid. And yeah, that's basically what we have so far. Something called the cost map. All right. Uh, well, the cost map is kind of big because we don't have like uh, an accurate uh, estimation of where the robot actually is, and therefore we could be anywhere here, and therefore our obstacles, you know, might be right in front of us. So what we need to do first is we need to reinitialize our location. So we'll use Arvis to do that. We need to estimate our initial pose. So we're going to do that to initialize the AMCL parameters. All right. So we'll click the 2D Pose Estimate button in the Arvis menu. So if you open up Arvis here, you can find there is a 2D Pose Estimate here. And we're going to click it. And then you need to determine where the actual robot is located and drag the large green arrow towards the direction the robot is facing. So... Where the robot actually is, it's somewhere, I guess, here. So, it's looking somewhere here. And this is why the map shifted, right? Or the the AMCL, or the map that is fed to the AMCL shifted. And this is why the, the whole estimation process of the robot location has changed. Because these, this AMCL depends or relies on the static map that we drew. And the static map is shifted from the actual physical situation. So we need to adjust this map. So I'm going to just move the arrow a little bit here. Sorry, I need to click 2D Pose Estimate. No, not uh, Yeah, 2D Pose Estimate again. So I'm going to shift the robot a little bit here. I'm going to click here. So yeah, the map is kind of closer to reality. So I'm I need to... Bring the robot a little bit, um, you know, a little bit here, and yeah, it, sorry, I forgot, I, I need to click the 2 heat pose estimate whenever I do this. 
So I'm gonna bring the robot like here. Yeah, it's better, but still, I might bring it a little, a little further here. Yeah, maybe here. So yeah, I think they are kind of aligned. So the global map is currently aligned. The local map is, you know, kind of aligned with the global map as well, I guess. Yeah, so the maps, you know, are currently close to each other. So the maps are aligned and I think I'm closer to the right location of the robot than I ever was. So what I'm going to do next is um, um, launch the teleoperation node. All right. What the teleoperation node would do is that it will continue moving the robot. And as we said before, when you're, um, you know, using localization, then having a static map that already exists and having the current uh, readings of the sensor, which is the LiDAR sensor, would help us, like, better localize the robot. So we have the static map or the map given, and we've got some... LiDAR sens uh, sensor updates that keep updating the current location of the robot. So I'm comparing these LiDAR sensors or these little local maps with a global map, and I'm saying that the robot may have moved a little bit to the right, a little bit to the left. So I'm beginning to gain some insight on where the robot really is. So uh, by moving the robot and by investigating new areas in my map and comparing the two maps, I might have a better idea where the robot is, you'll find that your distribution will become more concise, your, uh, it will become smaller, and it will become concentrated on the actual location of the robot. So let's actually view that. So I'm going to use the teleoperation node. I'm going to run it. And yeah, I'm going to launch it in a new tab. And probably it's going to ask me to determine that my robot is burger. So yeah, let's explore the burger thing. Let's paste here our teleoperate law uh, node. So we've got Arvis here and we've got our node here. So let's just focus on the green dots that represent our probability distribution here. So I'm going to move a little bit forward. So you can find that the distribution is beginning to become more concentrated and the number of particles is reduced as, as I move forward. Because I'm beginning to compare the map against the global map, then I'm beginning to gain insight. Yeah, this this place is like you're navigating through some area which you don't know. So you have a map in your hand, right? And you're driving. So you're beginning to compare the landmarks you see against the map. And you're beginning to gain some insight in, wh in where you really are. So you're lost at the beginning. But by comparing the map you have in your hand with the landmarks you can, you're seeing uh, during your, uh, you know, uh, drive you get to know where you are and this is what essentially happens here so i'll move forward continue to move forward and then you'll find that the that this distribution becomes more concentrated towards the mean or towards the actual value so yeah i'll begin to have like a drive here and then i'm going to stop and then i'm going to get back here so i'm gaining more and more information my map is getting updated. So the more I move, let's just yeah, let's stop here. The more I move, the more information I get. So let's move faster. Yeah, the distribution is definitely better than it was, right? And sometimes the distribution expands, right? It sometimes expands in some little moments and this is because this environment is highly symmetric so sometimes I might mistake in one landmark for another for example if I'm here for example I might mistake in this landmark for this landmark for example because the environment looks really symmetric so the non-symmetric part here you'll find most likely that the distribution is better here because this part is different from this part. They are not symmetric, and this is why when I'm located here, I'm most likely gonna understand that I'm at this 
part of the environment, not this part. If it was perfectly symmetrical, then we might have like a, two, a modal distribution where we have one modal distribution here and one modal distribution here because I cannot really tell whether I'm here or here. All right. So I'll continue moving and you'll find that the distribution is quite fine so far. All right. So we have a better like estimation of where we are. Uh, right. Um, we can terminate uh, the totally operation node now because we have uh, localized our robot successfully. So what we need to do now is to set a navigation call and we need our robot to move autonomously from the initial position, which is the position it currently has, to some goal on the map. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open Arvis here and I'm going to click the 2D nav goal, which is, you know, like the tool or the visual tool that allows me to set um, like the desired location or the desired pose that I want the robot to have. So I'm going to click on this point, for example, which is the XY location. And I'm going to change the attitude or the orientation of the arrow to denote the theta. So I need the robot to be located at this X and Y with this orientation. So let's see what happens. Indeed, the planner works and it sends like control or uh, set points to the controller, which indeed controls the wheels. And then the robot starts to navigate autonomously towards this point. Um, Yeah, so yeah, we visualized the process, uh, sort of. So this is our coast map. You can find that uh, the obstacles are, are red in color. So that means that these areas have higher costs, while the blue areas represent like, you know, lower cost. So if you get this, the map that we just hit was the local map. So you can see that the local map is not the whole map of the environment. It's just some, you know, it's related to the origin of the robot. So the origin of the robot or the origin of the odometry system represents the origin of this local map here. All right. You can find that the global map is the big map. So when I hit that, yeah, that was the global map, which includes all the details of the environment that was uh, saved earlier. Uh, and here we have like the the local coast map, which like deter this map is responsible for determining like uh, you know sudden obstacles and stuff like that. It just you know focuses on the real close areas. So let's try another navigation goal. So let's try this for example. So you can find that a path is drawn, and part of this path is related to the local planner. All right. So you can find that the path changes to green, so, uh, changes to red sometimes. So the path was originally black and then it changed to red. So what this means, <coughs> what does this mean? It simply means that when I do this, for example, and this is a new 2D navigation goal. So you'll find that basically I start to plan a path that's solely based on the global planner. Right. On my on my already saved map and then as as I walk right I begin to compare my local map against the global map and I begin to slightly modify the the global path plan that I just devised in order to account for variations or slight variations in the local that, that the local plan uh, uh, dictates All right so you can find that the original pass is is black but the, plat but the path keeps adapting itself, right? So it slightly changes, right? But because the global, uh, we don't have any new obstacles here, so the global map is basically the same as the local map. So you won't find, you know, like serious modifications. But what if, for example, if in Gazebo, we decided to, you know, place some obstacle right here, for example. So let's place an obstacle here, all right? And let's say we want to navigate somewhere like, um, right, we may change that obstacle location to some other location. Right, let's move that obstacle. 
let's move it somewhere you know mm -mm -mm. it's too big for here so let's put a cylinder instead all right let's just put it here all right so the obstacle is here i want to get here so a reasonable choice would be if the robot is you know uh, ignoring the obstacles a reasonable choice would be just to you know walk through this path this seems to be the shortest best path but now there's an obstacle here so let's see how the robot reacts to that you can find that you know a part of the robot is now scanned and it's contained within the local map because the global map does not know that this obstacle exists but if you can you know if you focus on the local map here uh, and I think actually that the, lo that the local map starts to update the global map because if we hit the local map here you can find that the global map was slightly updated so yeah maybe they work hand in hand I'm not really familiar with the exact details of you know the control scheme or the strategy here but since the global map has been updated because it contains like a portion of that body so maybe the local map adds to the global map so the global map does not stay static all the time it updates itself based on the local map yeah so let's let's for example pick a 2d navigation goal here for example all right so let's see how the robot reacts all right it draws a path here but then suddenly we find that the obstacle is here right so this is the the advantage of the local planner because the local planner adjusts you know the plan all right something that was not present in the global map already or the map or the static map that we use for the global map initially has appeared so this is what the global planner does it adapts to that change and in fact it updates the global map as well because you can find that this became you know like an obstacle contained within the global map so the global map kind of updated itself as well so the local map helps update the global map all right um, so the, the the global map is no longer just that static map that we drew at the beginning. It began to it began to update itself during the simulation. Um, so yeah, that's basically what we need to do to know so far. So yeah, that's the end of our implementation part for today. So let's sum up what we did today. We defined the terms navigation, path planning, and control, and defined the relationship uh, um, and how they work together in order to achieve the autonomous motion task. We also used the AMCL package, which is Adaptive Monte Carlo Localization, in order to localize the robot during motion. And we said that this is a pure localization algorithm, which means that it needed the map that we generated earlier using the gmapping package. So we got a safe map plus laser scans that we continually uh, uh, collect uh, during our motion. And we feed that to the AMCL package in order for it to run its processing technique and produce the current location or the current pose of the robot during motion. And the output of the AMCL package is indeed fed to the planners, the, uh, uh, the local planner specifically, in order to you know, um, design or um, set the trajectory from the initial pose that we started with to the target pose that we need to reach. And we saw how the global planner and the local planner work hand in hand uh, in order to, you know, reach that pose and how the local planner helps to update, you know, uh, the the planning technique or the planning or the, or the plan in order to reach the target in a more efficient way and we saw that our local uh, observations helped update the global map as well and at the same time update the current uh, plan so the plan continues to update itself based on the new in, uh, on the new inputs that are delivered through the amcl package and the MCL package provides the location and you've got the laser scans which produce like multiple smaller maps or local maps that are compared against the global map and in fact uh, also tries to update the global map in order to account for new obstacles that were that weren't there in the static map that we drew earlier 
So that's basically, you know, some introduction to navigation, and I believe that the terms have been covered. So in the upcoming uh, videos, we'll focus on more uh, projects, right? Or uh, we'll focus on like, you know, developing some packages for autonomous navigation that are designed for specific purposes. And this is, you know, the closest we can get to becoming actual ROS developers that are working on some ROS project that has to do with a product instead of just getting introduced to some terms or running packages that allows us to use utilities. So I, I guess that the most fun part of the pro of the of this course is lies in the upcoming videos. So stay tuned.